Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to the webinar. Uh, this is Janet Edmondson and I am looking forward to spending this time with you tonight. Um, if you can't hear me, please put something in that question box so I will be aware of that. And I already see that some questions are coming in that we will address uh, a little later in the in the workshop. So thank you all for starting to add those in there. All right. Here we go. So welcome to our webinar, Caregivers Search for Meaning. I'm glad you took the time to join us. And I'm Janet Edmondson. I'll be presenting this webinar. So I'll be presenting the next webinar on Wednesday, February 27th. The topic is the power of forgiveness, how it can help caregivers. You'll receive the link to register in a follow-up email from us tomorrow. Even if you can't make that date, please register anyway, as we'll be recording it for you to watch later at your convenience. As we're waiting for everyone to join us, um, I, let me share some information about my books and other products. They're available on my website at affirmyourself.com, or you can order them from Amazon or your local bookstore. Some of you already found the question box, and for those of you that don't, my last administrative item uh, is to let you know about it. Um, it's in the panel to your right. And if you can type something in the question box and then uh, click send, um, I will look forward to answering those questions at the end of our session today. Now, let me quickly tell you a little bit about, about my background. From a career standpoint, I have a master's degree from Georgia State University and over 30 years experience in leadership within the worksite health promotion field. However, if you've participated in our webinars before, you know that I took care of my husband, Charles, during the five years he faced a movement disorder that had cognitive losses as well. We initially thought that he had either PSP, which is progressive supranuclear palsy, or CBD, which is cortical basal degeneration but confirmed on autopsy that it was actually CBD. I am a past chair of the Board of Directors for Cure PSP and have been a support group leader for two online groups and a face-to-face -face group for many years. I currently live in South Portland, Maine. This picture is of Charles and me when we had a very special opportunity to attend an educational session at Auschwitz. That leads me to Viktor Frankl. If you're not familiar with Viktor Frankl, he was a Holocaust victim that spent time in Auschwitz. He wrote the wonderful book, Man's Search for Meaning. I read it sometime during the last year of Charles's life. And while it sounds difficult to read, I actually found it uplifting. I encourage you all to pick it up as well. He describes how terrible his experience was and that of the other victims in the concentration camps. But even then, he was able to find meaning. He realized that no one can take away our most important freedom, the freedom to determine one's own attitude, an attitude of finding meaning. Gordon Alport, who wrote the preface to Frankel's book, suggests that the book's central theme is this, to live is to suffer, to suffer is to find meaning in the suffering, end quote. Frankel su uh, survived the atrocities and indignities of a concentration camp in World War II. With Charles's disease and that of your loved ones, our job is to find meaning from our suffering and our experience. 
One quote that I love from Frankel is this. Life holds a potential meaning under any conditions, even the most miserable ones. So no matter what our experience is right now in our caregiving, as bad as it can be, Frankel says we can still find meaning. We can make it happen. In order to find meaning, however, we need to accept the things we cannot change. That's why I love the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. But what does that mean to accept the things we cannot change? I got an aha about that on how to accept the things we cannot change when Charles and I attended the Mind Body Program at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston. Peg, the instructor of the program, said in the very first class, the way to accept our disease and situation is to make meaning out of it. Wow. Make meaning out of it. Think about that. That's a proactive way to think about accepting the things we cannot change instead of just being passive. That got me into the right framework of mind from the beginning. How could I give Charles the best rest of life as possible and thereby have us both find meaning in the experience? I learned another way to accept life's struggles from M. Scott Peck in his book, The Road Less Traveled. He writes in the very first sentence, life is difficult. He calls this a great truth. He sees and hears people moaning about their difficulties as if life is supposed to be easy. However, he goes on to explain that once we truly understand and accept that life is difficult, then we can deal with it. Again, it's all in our expectations. We should expect that life will be difficult and that is what can help us accept these caregiving challenges and struggles. Okay, so to summarize what we've discussed so far, we need to accept the things we cannot change. And to do that, we can make meaning out of our challenges and set our expectations that life will be difficult. Accepting Charles's disease and making meaning out of it didn't mean that we didn't feel pain. Coping with this type of degeneration was difficult physically and emotionally for Charles, the person with the disease, as well as for me, the caregiver. Primarily, there is the sadness for all the losses. Charles has experienced so many progressive physical and cognitive losses. I experience the slow loss of my best friend and husband. As the disease progressed, Charles couldn't participate in two-way conversations. So the person who had encouraged me to be, my, to be my best self and find my voice was no longer able to do that. This experience was certainly the hardest challenge of my life. We faced many trials, some successfully, others not so much. But the tremendous pain along the way did not stop us from finding opportunities at every juncture. And I think I'd have to say that I became a better, more empathic person than before I was forced to deal with Charles's condition. Let's look for a moment at a couple of research studies to understand how we can find meaning even in the most difficult times in our lives. A study by psychologist and researcher Laura King found that when we have positive emotions, such as love, joy, kindness, and awe in our life, we feel and sense more meaning in our life and work. This is critical 
Because when we think our life is worthwhile and important, we can have greater life satisfaction no matter what is going on in our lives. And then psychologist and researcher Barbara Fredrickson conducted a study which showed that those positive emotions actually helped to bring on resilience after a crisis. Her study looked at college students before and after the events of 9-11. That's why I have the two towers on the picture here. Findings from her study suggest that positive emotions, like we've talked about, love, joy, kindness, awe, etc., in the aftermath of the crisis of 9-11, seems to buffer resilient people against depression and fuel thriving. This can then build on itself to expand and grow the positive, hence her broaden and build theory. The more we bring on positives, the more they beget more positives. Just know that positive emotions can fuel your thriving in the midst of the crisis you and your family are facing. Let's now consider how we can make meaning of our loved one's illness and our caregiving responsibilities. We can find meaning in a big way, such as through our life's mission and purpose, and also in many, many, many little ways by making meaning out of everyday experiences. And that's what we're going to focus on today. In some ways, meaning is the sense we make of our current uh, circumstances. With the concepts and the research that I've already talked about, let's now look at some ideas of how we can actually make meaning out of the difficulties of our caregiving experiences. And let's start with this first one making meaning in the little things. One of the little things that supported my search for meaning was when Charles would smile. Eventually, his disease would take this ability away from him and give him that typical Parkinsonian apathy look. But take a look at this picture. I so relish seeing his smile here. This particular incident was at his company's annual holiday party. I think I may have been reading a tribute that others had written for Charles. I can tell from that smile that he was understanding the significance of the event and how special it was. This is an example of a time to savor that smile and the meaning it signifies. Positive psychologists also encourage us to find meaning in the day-to-day -day tasks, the little things, the menial things of life. The way they say to do this is to reframe these insignificant tasks until we see some ultimate purpose and value. This might be hard uh, to incorporate, but I think it can uplift you with the mundane and sometimes aggravating tasks you do each day. So in this process, you infuse ordinary events with some positive value. Here's how it works. And I encourage you to think about um, a menial task that's part of your day-to-day -day caregiving experiences. So with that menial task in mind, first of all, ask us, what's the purpose of the task? And what will that task accomplish? Once you answer that, assuming it alone doesn't give you meaning, you then ask yourself, well, what does that lead to? If the answer to that doesn't give you meaning, ask again of that new result. What does that lead to? Then continue to ask, what does that lead to until you get to something meaningful for you? This is how to connect every small thing to the larger picture of what gives you meaning. So here's a specific example. The menial task in this example is to get Charles dressed in the morning, which was quite difficult and sometimes frustrating with his muscles uh, being so rigid and the inability of him to help in any way. And I frankly lacked the experience of how to do this initially. Then, when I ask myself, what is the purpose of that task to get Charles dressed in the morning, I respond, he's dressed for his day. 
but I still don't feel much meaning from that yet. So then I ask, well, what does that lead to? Well, he can now go out and be with other people. I'm getting closer to some meaning, but not quite there yet. So I ask myself again, what does that lead to? The answer, it gives him something to look forward to. Then again, what does that lead to? It gives his life meaning because he's a people person. Bingo. I've gotten to something meaningful out of a menial task. I hope that makes sense on how that works. You just simply ask, what does that lead to? What does that lead to? Until you get to something meaningful for you. And for me, it would be meaningful if I knew that I had Charles ready to be with people in this example that I gave you. So I encourage you to try this with some of your menial and unpleasant tasks. It's a way to reframe them and help you at least visualize some ultimate meaning out of them. In general, you might find meaning in a menial task if it makes your life easier for your loved one. You might find meaning if it teaches you some new skills. You might find meaning in the menial task if it helps you grow as a person, maybe with more patience, more empathy and such. Or you might find meaning in a menial task if something doesn't quite go right, it allows you to learn from your mistakes so that you become a better caregiver and person in the future. The next how to find or make meaning is from the impact you or your loved one have on others. Let me explain what I mean. First, Charles's impact on others. This disease in some ways gave Charles more influence. Especially as his speech started to falter, people really listened when he would talk. On another note, he realized he needed to write his leadership book now. It wasn't going to get any easier if he waited. Lauren, in the picture, is one who had extreme respect for Charles. So that when Charles's disease progressed and Charles could no longer write or type to continue his book, Lauren sacrificed eight months of Saturdays to help Charles. But doing this for Charles, um, Lauren gained a lot of meaning, especially with the book finally published and knowing he was a part of keeping Charles's leadership principles and legacy alive with it. Then I think about my impact on Charles. The more I committed myself to helping Charles fulfill his goals, the stronger I felt in my caregiving and the more meaning I derive from it. This picture with Lauren and Charles is at the book signing event we had at a Borders bookstore. This is not, not easy to pull off as Charles was having tremendous problems sitting still and he had started a spell of yelling. But with lots of help, we did it, and that launched his book, giving him personal meaning and me pride and meaning in helping this get accomplished. Then I think about my impact on other people. Other people, close friends, as well as just acquaintances, would comment on how special our way of dealing with the disease was. They were inspired by what they saw in us. Charles's tenacity to stay relevant for as long as possible, and my desire to help him achieve that. Even the hospice nurse commented on how we were using a positive attitude to get through this experience, which she said can be a challenge for many. A big way to find meaning is to look at the way our caregiving experience is giving us opportunities to grow. We may not be happy or enjoying the need to learn these new things. Let me just say that right off the bat here. But in retrospect, we typically find that they are meaningful for our lives going forward. While we weren't scaling snow-covered mountains like this man, it sure felt like it. But our experience allowed both of us to grow. Charles would say that he had always talked too fast. 
So the slowing of his speech early in his disease forced him to slow down, which he thought might be helpful for others to understand him. One of the ways I was forced to grow was to get comfortable with stepping down my work hours um, from 50 to 60 hours a week to 40. Charles and I had always worked long hours because we were so passionate about our jobs, but this was a time for me to get better balance in my life. This meant that I needed to learn to delegate more of my work projects to others. It was ultimately a good thing for me to find satisfaction in working a normal work week. While Charles was sick, it allowed me to spend important time with him after work. After Charles died, it allowed me time for quiet and peaceful comfort at home during the weeknight evenings. And my staff at work enjoyed their new projects and responsibilities, giving them opportunities to grow. There was a whole cascading effect here, wasn't there? I've heard other caregivers talk about ways they were forced to grow through their caregiving experiences. Some how, learn, had to learn how to do the, fi um, the family finances, which served them well going forward. Others have told me that they had to learn to cook. All of these opportunities to grow really do add more meaning to our lives, even if, at first, we want to reject that idea. Research in psychology reveals that one of the biggest ways to find meaning is through our relationships. It is true that during our loved one's illness, some of the people who we thought were our best friends did not come through, did not come through for us, excuse me. But the ones who stuck with us become even closer friends. The bond that we build with them gets stronger and more meaningful. Also, we found quality relationships with some of the new friends we met during our journey, even, you know, either like through support groups or just through our community. For instance, when Charles fell once, the local dentist, this was on a Saturday, came and helped us. I mean, this was great. Uh, to have just these even uh, simple relationships uh, in the community. And all of these gave our lives more meaning. Charles would comment on how wonderful and kind even strangers were. These are the people from Charles's social network across the US. These people stuck with him and supported him throughout his disease. This is my longtime friend, Jean, who, along with other good friends, supported me throughout Charles's illness. Just having Jean to talk to or go to dinner with uh, imparted a lot more meaning into my life. And I must say balance as well. The next way to find meaning or make meaning out of our experience is by maintaining a sense of self throughout. This is critical. Because when we think our life is worthwhile and important, we have greater life satisfaction no matter what is going on in our lives. One of the ways we maintained a sense of self was to keep doing the things we loved as best we could. That's why we did all we could to keep Charles working for as long as possible in the job he loved so dearly, even providing a home health aide to assist with his work responsibilities. That's why we helped him keep jogging for as long as he could, way into his neurological disease when he even had trouble walking because he was committed to this. This was part of his sense of self. And that's why we continued to travel, even though it became physically difficult for Charles and for me. This is a picture of us at the Atlanta Olympics in 1996, about a year into Charles's disease progression. These trips that we took were very meaningful for us. All these things helped Charles and me find positive meaning even during this very difficult disease process. What passions, strengths, or interests give you a sense of self? You are more than just a caregiver. Who else are you? 
a singer, a musician, an artist, a Sudoku player, a bridge player, an avid reader, an engaged grandparent, an exercise enthusiast. Even though we can be overwhelmed with caregiving, uh, caregiving responsibilities, we don't need to be selfless. An example is someone in my support group who realized how critical some quiet devotional time was for her to be able to maintain a sense of self. But she'd get frustrated and mad when her husband would interrupt her during that time. He'd be trying to get dressed and struggle and be, you know, just yelling out. And uh, it just ruined that quiet time she was looking for. So she decided to get up an hour early to make sure her needed private devotional time was protected. I was so proud of her for doing that. So consider what makes you who you are and work with your support team to be able to get time for those things, even if just a little time. You know, is it something in the exercise physical activity realm? Is it something musical or some kind of hobby or interest? I hope you'll work with your care team to find ways to do just a little about that. Finally, let's look at how to find meaning by looking for the gifts, or we could just say the word opportunities, if gifts is too, too big of a word for you, uh, this experience is giving us. But I like the word gifts. I look for the gifts that only this type of challenge afford. I think it takes a struggle to really get to some depth of relationships and depth of learning. So I like to think back to 9-11, going back to our picture of the towers. Um, in our country, this was the worst attack on the U.S. since Pearl Harbor, and nearly 3,000 people died that day. Not to minimize those deaths, though I like to think about how you felt about your family, friends, and community after 9-11, that next day, that next week, that next month. Didn't you feel closer to them? I think that is a gift of 9-11 that we all experienced. We also experienced the flags going up everywhere over the, the overpasses. And at that time, bringing the country together in a special way. I think that was a gift of 9-11. And as I drove into work on the Massachusetts Turnpike after 9-11, the typically rude Massachusetts drivers, especially the, even the taxi drivers, were actually nice. And that was also a gift of 9-11. Now, we gladly give back all those gifts if we could have the towers back up and all the people alive, right? But we can't. This tragedy happened. But we can still be thankful for the gifts it brought. You and your family are going through your own personal 9-11. So I hope you can also look for and find the gifts that only this kind of challenge can afford. So one of the gifts I saw for us was Charles and his brothers. Um, it's a long story, but... Charles, um, he was the oldest, and his parents were not very socially adept. So Charles, when he was younger, became kind of the father figure, uh, definitely big brother figure for these kid, for these two boys um, as they were growing up. Uh, but Charles had a first wife and an ultimate divorce, and that was not acceptable in the faith that this family had. And the family pulled apart, and Charles felt separated from them. When Charles and I got married, he didn't even bother to invite his family because he didn't think they would want to come. However, over time, we were starting to build back this relationship. But Charles's disease accelerated that and really brought these guys together. It was so beautiful to see. And, I mean, you can just see the closeness even right here with them. And so that 
a reconnection of these boys together, to me, was a gift of Charles's struggle. When I've spoken at <clears throat> Parkinson's group, I remember one time there was a daughter there with her father, and they both had Parkinson's. And they said one of the gifts of Parkinson's for them was that they now had more time together. I remember speaking to an, an Alzheimer's group in Florida, and a man <clears throat> whose wife was in the very late stages of Alzheimer's described how his two daughters hated each other when they were younger, hated each other through high school, hated each other when they had their young kids. It wasn't until their mom got Alzheimer's that they found a connection with each other. And this really pleased the father. In fact, I was surprised to hear him say, I would have my wife go through this again with Alzheimer's so that my daughters could find that they do love each other. One last gift that um, we all have when we're dealing with a degenerative disease is to have the time to say goodbye and give accolades and tributes. And I have to say, this was just so powerful with Charles. He had people uh, from work who loved him dearly, who um, someone gathered tributes that each of them wrote and put it in a book. And one person recorded them all because Charles, his eyes were impacted by this disease. They wouldn't move correctly, so he couldn't read. But he could listen to the tapes. It was almost like a eulogy while he was still alive. And how wonderful. I mean, this just touched him so strongly to hear those comments from all these people who loved him while he was still alive. Again, a gift of this terrible degenerative disease. I also found gifts <clears throat> through friends that I met through my support group. I wouldn't have known Patty or Rhonda had we all not faced this problem. Patty's significant other had the same disease and Rhonda's mom. We have remained close friends since we met back in Oh, the year 2000, I guess, maybe earlier than that, actually. And we get together regularly, even though I now live in Maine and they're still in Massachusetts. We still get together quite regularly. And, <clears throat> you know, at the time, I would have gladly given back these friends to have Charles back with me and healthy. But that wasn't a choice I had. Charles had this disease. I could at least welcome the gifts of these two beautiful friendships that I so love. I encourage you to look for the gifts your caregiving experience has given you. Yes, this is a difficult journey. Our loved ones don't deserve the struggles their disease is giving them every day. And we don't deserve the extra work and anguish that this experience is giving us. But this is what is. We can complain about it and feel like a victim, that that limits us to live in the negatives of life. Or we can choose at least to let some of the positives of life buoy us up. One great way to keep an eye out for the gifts is to ask yourself, what went well today? Psychologists encourage us to do this uh, every day, um, or at least practice it for a while till we begin to start noticing the things that are going well, and to list at least three things so we dig deep to really find the things that went well. And I bet in some of those things that went, went well, you will find some of the gifts of that particular day. And once we identify them, we can savor them, make them stick a little bit more, milk them for all they have to give us. Now, I ask you to pick at least one of the tips I mentioned to try to incorporate in your search for meaning. Let me go back to that list of tips. 
Make your action plan from this webinar. Make, figure out what you want to really try to focus on in ways to make meaning and remind yourself and think about these regularly. And now, oops, I'm going the wrong way. I'm so sorry. Here we go. That was a nice little review, huh? <laughs> All right. Now, before I give you my final quote, so I hope you'll stay on because I've got a great quote at the end. Um, I'd like to take your questions, and I know we already have some questions. So let me open up that question box and answer these as best I can. <sighs> Uh, Connie, you asked, uh, what was the book Viktor Frankl wrote? It's called Man's Search for Meaning. It's where I got the title to this, you know, to modify it for this webinar. Man's Search for Meaning. Um, Carrie asked, could you please address feelings of guilt? Yeah. <laughs> I think guilt is always a part of the caregiver experience. And Carrie, I will mention that I did do a webinar on guilt, and I'll show you where you can pick that up in just a minute, along with my other webinars that are recorded. Um, but I think we need to give ourselves grace when we feel these feelings of guilt. Uh, typically, we are guilting ourselves when it's when we should not be, <laughs> when we don't need to be, because at any point in time. We are usually doing the best we can. It doesn't mean we're perfect. So we are messing up. We are, maybe we lose our patience or um, we do something we're not proud of. But we want to let that go and forgive ourselves and move forward. That's the only way to find the hope to take that next step. So I hope that helps, Carrie. But I think the, um, the book that I... Um, I mean, the, the recordings, I'll show you where they are in a minute, will be helpful. You also said, I know that I need to have a little time on my own, but I always feel so guilty for having abilities that my loved one no longer has. Thank you. Um, yeah, we do need to have a little time on our own, and we do feel guilty when we do it. I can remember one thing specifically that I, with that, uh, thought there, Carrie, that I struggled with. Charles um, had made a commitment to run um, as his daily personal victory. We kept him going for as long as we could, even when we had to hold his arm to keep going. And then we had to talk him into walking as this daily personal victory. And we continued to do that. Uh, the only way we could keep doing that was to take him up to the grocery store so we could hold on to the shopping cart because that was the only thing that gave him enough stability to keep walking and running. But he had a couple of uh, weeks in the hospital, two hospital stays in one month, and things really went downhill after that. And I realized that we couldn't continue that. But I needed to get my exercise. So I can't tell you how guilty I felt when Charles was laying there and I was in the treadmill in the next room trying to get my exercise. So I think that guilt is normal, but we are doing the right thing. As you said, we know we need to have a little time for ourselves. And in fact, people will tell you, professional caregivers will tell you that when we can get a little time for ourselves, we will then be better caregivers when we get back with our loved one. We have a little more patience. We have a little bit more um, uh, sense of uh, calm um, and, and a little more meaning in our life to then be able to do what we need to do with all those caregiving responsibilities. So thank you, Carrie, for those questions. I don't see any other questions, so let me continue on. And I'll give you my email where you can ask questions later if you have some after the webinar. So let me just remind you that we have um, the next webinar set up for February 27th, and that will be the power of forgiveness, how it can help caregivers. So um, when you get the follow-up email, uh, probably later tomorrow, 
uh, there, there should be hopefully a link in that that will allow you to click and register for this upcoming um, webinar. You can always email me um, if you want me to give you that link as well. Now, I promised Carrie and others I would tell you how you can get to some of my free recordings. I have a YouTube channel, and if you just type in Janet Edmondson, there's no second D in my name, so just one D. If you type in Janet Edmondson in YouTube, you'll come up with my all of my um, YouTube webinars. And I wanted to mention that I have one on holiday stress. And I'm not going to be doing that one live this year. So if you haven't heard that one, please go listen to that one because we've got the holidays coming up. And I think it's content that you could uh, definitely enjoy and use. And you will also uh, see the one on guilt there. Um, and, and many others, like the other one I have up here is Feel Empowered While Caregiving, but there's probably a good 10 or so um, recorded webinars up there that you can watch whenever you want. Again, I just want to mention my books. Uh, people have told me, and it always touches my heart, that they help them through their journey. So I have books, audio books. I have it in the e-reader also. Um, so do look on Amazon or on my website. Now, my final quote. I hope you all know who Maury Schwartz is. Um, you probably have heard about him. He is the subject of the book Tuesdays with Maury that was written by Mitch Album. Uh, and that would be my second book recommendation for today. So the first one was Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. The second is Tuesdays with Maury by Mitch Album. Again, they both sound like they're going to be depressing, but they're not. They're just really a highly inspirational and uplifting. Maury Schwartz had ALS, and he was interviewed by Mitch Album over the course of many Tuesdays when Mitch would go and travel to um, his old professor to talk about Maury's thoughts on living. Not on dying, but on living. So here's a quote that goes with our thought today of meaning. He said, because if you found meaning in your life, you don't want to go back. You want to go forward. My best to you all as you continue to find meaning in your life, in your situation, so that you can go forward. And with that, I will say thank you. Feel free to contact me directly. Here's my email address, Janet at AffirmYourself.com. And I hope you'll join me for some of those future uh, webinars. Meanwhile, please find peace, comfort, and meaning, even in the midst of the struggles of the caregiver responsibilities you have. And with that, I'll say good night.